Oh my, 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 my. Hello, it's Ren Presents Time. I'm your host, Ren, and today we continue with the Hazards of the Old Ones, Part 2, Chapter 8, Larson of Xenon, Verlin of Hobby. So last week, we hung out with Madame Kylos of Tusk as she made her lonely way through Castle Blanchford, not being the first officer of the Seeker, not soaring the heavens with her best friends, Captain Davidge, and Countess Sigillus, and the various trials and tribulations she encounters. Uh, she eats her breakfast at the end of the giant ass table in the Los Capricos Hall, his table is two or three hundred feet long. Sometimes I'll say it's two, sometimes I say it's three. It's just a big long table and I remember me and my wife took a trip to Scotland several years ago and we stayed in a Scottish castle. Ooh, what fun. And they had a really big long table. It wasn't 200 feet long, it was maybe 10 or 15 feet long bunch of chairs there lots of like suits of armor and stuffed animals staring down at you and so forth and I came down and I, I ordered a breakfast like a sampler of Scottish food which was a little unusual but I'm adventurous so I tried it and so forth but my wife hadn't come down yet she was still in the shower and I was just remember sitting at the end of that table all by myself you know, eating this Scottish breakfast and every so often the kitchen staff would come out if I needed it something but I, I just remember it just felt really lonely sitting on that on that big table all by myself and that's what I tried to recreate and capture with this chapter of Kai miserable mi wanting to be on the ship wanting to be an officer again just sitting there meekly eating her breakfast just staring at the table with Tweeter as her only companion. Eventually, she hooks up with Carahill and he convinces her to go on this mission with him to the south. He's still vague on what they're going to be doing in the south, but at the end of the chapter, Kai mounted up and Carahill flew off and off they went. This week, we meet a few new characters as the story progresses. We get to see Sig all pissed off and hitting Captain Davidge with relentless telepathy as she oftentimes does. We meet two people vying for the first officer role aboard the Seeker. So let's see what happens here. This is one of my, I enjoy this chapter. Quite a bit shorter than the previous one. Shouldn't take too long to get through. And I think it should be fun. In any event, let's proceed immediately. Part two, chapter eight. Larson of Xenon, Verlin of Hobby. And when we're done, I'll give you um, a, an update on some of these characters so you can see what I had in mind for them that didn't necessarily come into fruition. The marine cutter Quincy appeared through the murk. A tiny ship, not a sixteenth the size of the Seeker, it calmed in the traditional manner, sought permission to come abeam, or directly in front of the ship, and dock. The cutter, though small, was a bit too large to fit into the Seeker's internal docking bays. Deftly, the little red and black rocket-shaped vessel maneuvered into position and docked with a clank. The colorful marine cutter stood in contrast to the white fleet seeker. All fleet vessels were painted white. It wasn't long before another small vessel emerged from the darkness. This time it was a fleet Tekel class scout ship, the Dorset. 
tackles look like three bananas evenly spaced around an ovular shaped saucer, hence their apt nickname, the Banana Boat. It, like the marine vessel, wanted to send a party aboard. After the usual courtesies were exchanged, a rip car from the Dorset made berth in Bay 2. Dole, you're gonna get it later, Dav. What have I told you about this? Sig, hands on hips, telepathied as the door to his office closed. She looked good and furious in her gray gown, her big green eyes on fire. Davidge sat down behind his desk. The white-painted Dorset, the banana boat standing at nine, appeared motionless several miles away through his windows. Dav, open this damn door right now, or I swear I'm gonna blast it down. Dav! Sig wasn't kidding when she said her emotions were going to be out of sorts. She was frothing mad. The chairs in Davidge's office were in short supply. Two marines, a male and a female, glorious in their red uniforms, sat to one side, and two fleet officers, a commander and a lieutenant, both men, sat on the other. Dev, answer me! I want in! There's no room, Sig, and again, this is fleet business. Then move to the conference room if there's no space. I'll be waiting for you there, and you better show, or you and I are going to have a fight like never before. He thought he heard something hit the door. She appeared very put off. Sir, the male marine said, this is a great honor. I am Major Westwind, 53rd Marines, and I wish to proudly introduce Lieutenant Verlin, also of the 53rd Marines. Lieutenant Verlin spoke up. Sir, it is a great pleasure for me to be here. I have long followed your exploits, she said in a cultured South Cana accent, distinctly Remnath, if he wasn't mistaken. Davidge looked at Lieutenant Verlin. She was tall, blonde-headed, very similar to Kylos. The Marines apparently were hedging their bet by trotting out a virtual Kylos lookalike. But in this case, Lieutenant Verlin wasn't a Johnny. Clearly, she was a lady of standing, and a Remnath at that. She sat properly with ladylike grace. Her face was made up within marine regulations, and her golden hair was set in a Remnath style. Her eyes, her cheekbones, her accent, her hair. She had the hobby look, an old Remnath great house from Howell. Lieutenant, Davidge said. Are you by chance a lady of house hobby? I am, sir, yes. Your father is Lord Merivel? He is, sir. Good man. Honest merchant, Davidge said. Verlin blushed and rustled a bit in her chair. Sir, I had the pleasure of briefly meeting you some years ago, before I joined the Marines. Davidge was interested. Really? He said, looking hard at her. I must apologize, Lieutenant. You have me at a disadvantage. I take great pride in being able to recall faces, and I cannot place yours. Oh, I, I was wearing a muffler. My face was obscured. Davidge smiled. Ah, oh, all bundled up, eh? I suppose that Blanchford is uncomfortably cold for someone from Howell. I'm assuming we met in Blanchford Village, yes? Yes, sir. It certainly was cold. However, I assume Howell might be a little warm for you as well. Well, indeed, I just about melted in Prost not long ago. Major Westwind spoke up. Sir, we feel Lieutenant Verlin will be an ideal candidate for you to consider in your selection process for first officer. She graduated top in her class at Marine Academy 4 on Bonham. She is expert on marine sensing stations and in Zaffin history and tactics. She is also fully briefed on straylight operations, including ops, missive, and navigation, and should hit the ground running for you. Lieutenant Verlin smiled, sitting straight and tall. Again, sort of like Kylos, but more regal. Clearly a blue lady, not a Johnny. Lieutenant, is it your wish to serve as first officer aboard the Seeker? It is, sir. I have followed your exploits through the years with great interest and very much wish to serve. 
Yes, sir. Davidge was impressed. Certainly seemed eager enough, this lady of hobby. But what about her soul? Her spirit? Davidge could teach any person to be the first officer. He couldn't, however, give her a heart. That she had to bring with her. House hobby. Davidge couldn't think of any other hobbies in the fleet. A merchant saw a long line of them. Lieutenant, he asked, interested. If I may, House Hobby is a fine and honorable southern house. Merchants plying a honest and true trade. I have transacted business with them many times myself and have always come away satisfied. I cannot recall any other member of House Hobby currently in the service, be it fleet, marine, or otherwise. May I ask, why have you chosen to serve and not baton to some fortunate gentleman at this point? Verlin looked down a moment and then smiled. Sir, it's, it's true my house has not done its fair duty in the past. I did not mean to imply that your house has not done its duty for the League. No, I know, sir. Thank you. I always wanted to see the stars, to leave Hal and find my own way for a bit. I looked up into the night sky and watched the fleet ships coming and going through my brother's telescope, the stories that each of those ships could tell. And I remember Merendra watching all those ships coming home blackened, ruined, and I wanted to do my part. I wanted to make something of myself so that someday when I have children, I will have stories of my own to tell. I want to be able to teach them something as well. Davidge bowed. I see, and yours is a sentiment that I share with you. I understand fully, and thank you for sharing that with me, Lieutenant. He sat and thought a moment. Major Westwind, may I borrow your SK, please? The Major looked a bit confused. Tentatively, he unclasped his holster. My weapon is not palm-branded, sir, he said and carefully handed Davidge his SK, butt first. Davidge accepted the weapon, pulled the mag out, cleared the chamber, and set it down on his desktop. Lieutenant, I'm afraid I hear the stun bottle leaking. Sir? She said, confused. Yes, most definitely. It's making a dreadful noise. Will you be good enough to clear it for me, please? The Major smiled, sat back, and watched. She slowly picked the gun up. With her graceful, hobby hands, she began taking the huge pistol apart. With your eyes closed, please, Lieutenant, Davidge added. Stray lights. One never know when the lights will go out. Verlin looked at him and then closed her eyes and began working. She started slowly, hesitantly, feeling the gun with her long, slim fingers, removing the pins... After a few seconds, she picked up the pace. Soon, she was expertly departing the weapon, turning it this way and that, removing small piece after small piece, and setting them down in an orderly fashion on the desktop. After several more seconds, she had the gun in seven pieces and held the stun bottle aloft. Davidge sat there a moment. He could smell her perfume, a fine southern remnant scent. Kai wore perfume about as often as Sig wore shoes. My mistake? The bottle seems fine, Davidge said. Please reassemble, and again, you needn't open your eyes. Eyes closed, she deftly reassembled the gun, and soon it was back together. As a final test, she dry-cocked the chamber with the usual satisfying chuck-chuck sound. The SK is the standard weapon of the Stellar Marines. It is our lifeblood and heritage, Captain. Every Marine should know its workings in and out, she said, handing it back to the Major. I agree fully, Lieutenant, and well done. Really an expert showing. Davidge offered her a cloth, and smiling, she wiped her hands, removing the light oil and grease from the SK's innards. Dav! I'm sitting here in the conference room awaiting your arrival. I'll not wait much longer. If I have to come marching back over there, you can rest assured I will be blasting down the door and a scene will commence to be made. The fleet contingent began stirring. 
Captain, if I may interrupt a moment. I am Commander Forsberg, Lord of Wilne, Adjutant Chief to Admiral Garth of the 10th Fleet. Sir, we are all shocked at the sudden departure of your Lieutenant Kylos. However, we at the Admiralty see this occasion as a grand opportunity. Sir, the Admiralty feels the fine vessel seeker, once our proudest warbird, is falling by the wayside to other ships. I see, Davidge said. And how so? It is obvious, sir. The seeker is always off in some far-flung reach, never in the league, never accommodating an admiral or other distinguished passengers of note. The marines looked at each other. Sir, Davidge said, the seeker is first and foremost a war vessel. The sworn mission of this ship is to uphold the ancient elder promise, to fight the Zaffins and defend life. And the seeker has done that. Ferrying passengers, grand and noteworthy as they may be, is a secondary concern. Sir, the day of the Zaffin is past. The League is victorious, and there are none with strength to stand before us. There is no more evil to fight, sir. Commander, there is always more evil for good to fight. The commander gave a curt smile. And so, well said... I have in attendance with me Lieutenant Larson, formerly of the 10th Fleet Office in Bern. We strongly suggest that you consider him for the position of first officer. We feel, with his assistance, the Seeker will once again be the talk of the fleet, as it rightly should be. And please note, Captain, Lieutenant Larson's programmability is rated at Elendi. Lieutenant Larson sat there, bedecked in his fleet uniform, and blushed a little. Oh, the fleet and its love of the sisters. Programmability was everything in the fleet, Davidge thought. He looked him over, tall, black-haired, clearly a lord of Xenon, a centrally located house at Blue Pierce. Davidge had to take a moment. For someone who prided himself on not being overly enamored with League society and posh inner circles, he was certainly up on most, if not all, of the great houses, despite himself. As a boy, his father, Sadrick, had beat it into his head. Hours and hours of society this and society that. As his grandfather, Mazerfeld, had drummed Carglore into Sadrick's head, he in turn forced League society down his. Hours and hours of learning to recognize minute detail, a distinctive turn of the brow, the tint of the hair, a certain fabric or scent. Sitting there as a boy, stewing, wanting nothing more to run off, hide, or get into another knuckle-busting fight with his sister Pardock. But as a fleet captain, Davidge had to admit, the ability to recognize familial traits... Their likes and dislikes, their history and family tree, to know a bit about the person before a word had even been spoken without having the stare, was very handy indeed. His son, Lord Cable, once born, shall have both Karg and Society Lord applied to him with vigor. Both, it seemed, were handy in a pinch. Lieutenant Larson, Davidge said, you are no doubt a lord of House Xenon. Yes, sir, well determined. Commander Forsberg chimed in. Yes, Captain, Lieutenant Larson has a very high programmability with the Sisterhood. I thought I might mention that once again. Davidge had to keep himself from rolling his eyes. Yes, yes, very commendable. Bear you the Los Capricos weapon of House Xenon, the Great Door? Larson gave a respectful smile. I do, sir. May I see it, please? Yes, sir. Davidge and Larson stood. Davidge unsaddled his carg and offered it to Larson. A common courtesy dictated a mutual exchange of Los Capricos weapons. Larson opened his coat and pulled out a silver rod, about eight inches long. The rod was handsomely filigreed with a bluish inlay. The lieutenant gasped as he took his card. Elders, he said, it is heavy. I'd heard, but was not fully prepared for its weight. 
Davidge looked over the great door and admired the craftsmanship. Sir, he asked, if I may. You may, sir. Davidge found the hidden stud, and with a snap, the rod expanded into a man-sized javelin. It vibrated with energy. Yes, very finely made. I must say, I've never been much to dwell on tradition, but the Los Capricos weapons of old is one tradition I find very much to my liking. Davidge retracted the weapon and handed it back, taking his carg in return. Lieutenant, have you ever served aboard a maiden fleet starship? Yes, sir. I was the comm officer aboard the Exidy for three years. Davidge ears pricked up. The Exidy was a sister vessel. Ah, the Exidy, obviously a ship that is very near to my heart. The comm is a very busy position, full of responsibility. Yes, sir, it was my honor to serve in that role. Davidge reseated himself and thought a moment. I appreciate your coming here today, the pair of you, he said, addressing both of them. If I am to be perfectly frank, I tend to promote from within to suitably reward one of my own for their hard work and dedication. Sir, Lieutenant Larson said, that is a wise policy and your crew no doubt appreciate the devotion you show them. However... I am certain that I'm not speaking out of turn when I say, given the short notice of this situation, your crew are urgently needed where they are and shan't be spared. Davidge thought a moment. Yes, that is true. Well said. Larson continued. We strongly feel that given your dangerous charge, a purpose-assigned officer will not only allow you to keep your valuable crew where they are, but provide you with instant experience and skill at the position. So, you both wish to serve aboard the Seeker. This is your wish and not hopes and designs imposed upon you? I wish to serve, sir, Verlin said. As do I, Larson said. This vessel shall be in harm's way, make no mistake. The Zaffins are still out there and they thirst for revenge. Their sex are on the rise, and they are potent with the gifts. They are spoiling to engage the League afresh, and are simply awaiting the moment to do so. Does such a prospect give either of you pause? No, sir, Lieutenant Verlin said. I am eager for the challenge, sir. Sig barged into his head. All right, Lord Blanchford, you had your chance. Sigillus of Metatron is coming for you, sir, and she is good and angry. I wouldn't want to be you right about now. Whenever Sig referred to herself with her old black hat name, Davidge knew she was peeved. Quickly, he sighted into the direction of the conference room, and sure enough, there was a rather rank Sig rolling up the sleeves of her Blanchford gown, stomping in his direction. She looked very dissatisfied, to say the least. Several crewmen scrambled to get out of her way. Quickly, Davidge continued, I must say that I am at a loss here. I can see no fault in either of you, at least from this brief initial encounter. There are certain advantages of having a Marine First Officer but I suppose I could use a fleet voice in my ear as well, lest I forget myself. He stood up. I will request that both of you remain aboard for the time being. Assume the joint role of acting first officer. Join me in council and test the waters. There, under trial, we'll see who has merit over the other. Also, during this interim period, I will continue to give ear to my crew, should any choose to present themselves as a possible candidate. I suppose when we return to Cana in a few weeks, a clear choice will be apparent. Does that meet with your approval, gentlemen and lady? Major Westwind stood and bowed. It does with us. Commander Forsberg stood. Indeed, and I am confident you will be delighted to select Lieutenant Larson at the conclusion of this trial period. It's agreed then. On the morrow, we shall begin. That will give the pair of you time to settle into your quarters and be refreshed. Davidge walked to the door. Oh, if you will please allow me to introduce Countess Sigillus of Blanchfort, my beloved wife. Davidge opened it and there was Sig arriving in a thunder. She looked about, saw all the people staring at her and bowed in a courtly fashion. Oh, that's dirty pool, Dav. Not fair. How am I supposed to yell and scream at you for locking me out when I've been properly introduced? 
Uh, my very thought. And with that, we conclude part two, chapter eight, Lars, uh, Larson of Zenon, Verlin of Hobby. So we are introduced to two officers vying for the post of first officer aboard the Seeker. The Marines trotted out a lady who looked a lot like Lieutenant Kylos, but is a... Uh, uh, Lady of Standing from Remnath, which is an area in the south of Cana, the southern continent, a large area known for like white hills. I, I always picture it like Spain a little bit, Remnath, just kind of a similar topography to Spain. And she's very dignified, comes from a house of merchants. She has a South League accent, and I've never quite figured out what that sounds like if it's like a british accent or a like a southern accent like a dixie accent or something of that nature never never quite made up my mind but she, whatever it is she speaks it it's up to you to how she sounds however you want her to sound and uh captain davidge put her to the test made her disassemble and reassemble an SK, which she did, and he was impressed. He was also impressed by Lieutenant Larson uh, Zenon, which is east of Remnath, and again in the southern continent. And he's from Blue Pierce, which is near the great Blue Pierce River, which is uh, one of the major rivers on Cana, known for the water that makes really good green spirits. Sort of like like Kentucky with that river water that's kind of infused with minerals and limestone and so forth that's supposed to make lip smacking bourbon, even though I, I find bourbon personally revolting. Meets them, offers them both the opportunity to vie for the position. Captain Davidge is, above all things, a, a fair minded individual, and he's more than happy to. Put him to the trial in a fair manner and see who who comes out on top. He would like to promote from within, but as Larson had pointed out, his crew are probably needed where they are, given the short notice of Kai's departure. And the whole time Sig was just be beating him up with telepathy. Sig hates being excluded whenever he's doing something official in his office, like in this case, talking to these uh, officers from other ships. And Sig wants in and wants to be included in whatever it is they're doing. Even if she's just sitting there being quiet, she wants to be in. And not letting her in is just pissing her off to no end. And she's hitting him up with telepathy hard. You know, all that banter back and forth between them is heard only between them, obviously. A couple notes. Lieutenant Verlin, I had ideas of using her in later books in the Temple of the Exploding Head trilogy. In the first draft, she became a love interest of Captain Davidge's son, Kay, who at this point is just a uh, an embryo in Sig's womb. He's not even born yet. And and I'm not sure how old Lieutenant Verlin is. She's probably in her 60s or 70s. Again, these people live for over 200 years, so she's still pretty young. Can't really tell because everybody looks young in the league. You don't really get old. But she's not that old. But I I was planning on her to you know be around and become a... A love interest of K, even though he's much younger, it doesn't really matter with these people because uh, once he gets of age, he's going to look just like her and, and vice versa. And the two just didn't have any writing chemistry. Yeah, that's important. Your characters, even the written word upon the page, they have to have a, a, a bond, a symmetry, a, a chemistry. And if it's not there, you got to take action. So I just, I cut her, I deleted her from the temple books. And and Sam, Lady Sammy Doran, became Kay's love interest and sort of, um, you know, just put her on the back burner. But that was my initial plan. Even in this early stage, I was like, well, 
Verlin here will be will be Kay's love interest. But nope, didn't work. So that is that chapter. Those are those characters. Next chapter, a very pivotal one coming up. Part 2, Chapter 9, The Hazards of the Old Ones. So we'll see where Luke Kai and Kara Hill end up. And we find out what Kara Hill needs Kai to do. And so that is a pretty pivotal chapter. Obviously, it's the name of the book. The same as the name of the book. So some crazy things are going to be happening next week. But that is then. This is now. Until then. This is Ren Presents. I am your host, Ren. Peace out.